I love the uh, title of our panel because um, uh, 2020 kind of hides the fact that uh, 2020 is only five years from now, which is a good thing because the way journalism is these days, uh, five years is almost an eternity. Change is, uh, the change is so rapid. But we have um, uh, four panelists here who can give us, I think, a, a terrific insight into um, where things are, are going, both in terms of what they're doing um, uh, themselves, uh, but also their, uh, their sense of what's, uh, what's happening what's happening around them. And um, I, I think I'd want to make just one quick point before we get um, to the panel, which is that um, I regard um, the rise of um, data journalism and associated digital capabilities as, um, as, revolution as, as revolutionary as anything perhaps this side of the printing press that we can think of that has um, uh, fundamentally changed uh, journalism, whether it's uh, the telegraph or photography or lithography or um, uh, radio, television, anything that you want to name, the, the, the capabilities that um, uh, data and digital journalism gives us, on, on, you know, on the one hand, the internet has destroyed the traditional model of, of um, uh, print journalism, uh, which has caused a lot of pain um, and disruption in um, uh, the way we work. But on the other hand, the opportunities that it's opening are um, uh, <coughs> phenomenal, just in the few years that uh, ProPublica has been alive, seeing what um, uh, can be done with these techniques and these capabilities, and and um, uh, Lee and Shazner were talking about um, how difficult it is to uh, recruit as many of, of um, these uh, data journalists as as um, one wants. Um, uh, people who can code and also think about stories. Um, but I see it the other way, which is the emergence of um, people who do combine those two instincts and those two uh, DNA sets um, has made things uh, possible that um, were not possible before. And um, the momentum is, is uh, just building. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, uh, start with each um, member of the panel and, and sort of give you three to five minutes to kind of talk about um, both uh, what you're doing yourself and, and how that um, uh, shapes your vision of what the next five years are, are like to be. And I'm going to start at the end with uh, uh, Brandon. Um, we at uh, um, ProPublica are happy users of um, your uh, CrowdTangle service. Um, it helps us uh, uh, find who's using our stories, uh, uh, particularly on, on uh, Facebook, and how we can perform better. So um, uh, we love you. Um, what, uh, um, what, can you, uh, what can you tell us about what's up with you and how you, how you see the next five years? Um, well, thank you, uh, and thank you to Pelly Center for uh, inviting me here. Um, so uh, I'm Brandon, the co-founder and CEO of uh, CrowdTangle. For those who don't know, um, we sit in this weird place of basically trying to augment uh, analytics that a lot of the platforms should probably be providing themselves in a lot of ways. Um, uh, I actually was a political activist for most of my life, um, and CrowdTangle got started as a way uh, to help bridge a gap in kind of community organizing work, and uh, turned into this a uh, social listening tool, um, and we work with a lot of great media and publishing companies, uh, including ProPublica. Um, you know, I think what we're seeing these days is that uh, data is obviously becoming ingrained in more and more of the workflow of journalism um, on, a, on a kind of increasingly fast trajectory. 
Um, and there are folks, probably a lot of folks in this room, who have been doing that for several years. But it's now starting to transition down the long tail of the media and journalism world. Um, we've been starting to work a lot uh, with folks at local news level um, who uh, uh, would never build an OFAN uh, for themselves, um, but are now starting to realize how important it is to do this stuff. Um, and I would say we provide kind of t two kind of core values when we think about data journalism. Uh, one is helping folks discover news. Um, there's an enormous amount happening on social media. Part of what we do is trying to make it really easy to discover stuff, especially from unexpected sources. Um, so everything from picking up on something happening at a police department in Iowa that's starting to get some traction on social, or listening to the LGBT community in you know, New Jersey. Um, and then the second one is also understanding how to distribute news a little more effectively on social media. Um, and you know, I think it's, it's, we get asked a lot about kind of what works and what doesn't and where things are going. And um, I think I generally agree with you, which is uh, things are moving so quickly in this space. Uh, it's very hard to make any projections. But I'd say there's kind of two things we usually say. Um, one is certainly, I think the best thing you can ask in terms of best practices is what works right now. Uh, these social media platforms are so big, and most of them tend to be founder driven, and so which means changes can happen very quickly. Uh, and so the best you can do is kind of ask what's happening right now and try to optimize for that. Uh, but that being said, I'm going to completely violate that first one and say I think uh, what probably doesn't get talked about enough is, um, it's ironic, it's been in the news, but video. Um, I think what's going to be happening with Facebook, and I think they've said this publicly once, uh, which is they expect the feed within a year to be mainly video. Um, and I think for a lot of folks who are in the print business, uh, in the news world, um, that's probably going to mean some pretty dramatic things for your Facebook traffic. Um, and if I think about where things are going to be in 2020, I actually think what's going to happen is probably messaging apps are going to end up filling in for that traffic. And so if we're here in 2020, I imagine we're going to have probably an entirely separate event just dedicated to video on social, and then trying to figure out uh, how you optimize for WeChat uh, to make sure your stories are told. Um, that being said, those could be entirely inaccurate by the time we get to 2020. <laughs> so, um, OK, Alexis next, um, uh, who's the uh, creative director of the New York Times R&D Lab and who is really thinking about the future because that's pretty much the domain you work in. That's my job, yeah. And um, uh, so what's up with you and, um, <laughs> and uh, how do you see things going? Um, so as you said, uh, the R&D Lab at the Times is tasked with really trying to look around corners and trying to investigate emerging technologies and emerging behaviors and understand kind of the weak signals of what might be coming next and how that might impact media and journalism a few years out. And we do a lot of that, that kind of research through making. So we do a lot of prototyping and tool making to better understand those technologies and what might be built with them and what kinds of experiences might be made possible. Um, and I think in terms of thinking about data journalism specifically, that there are a couple of um, trends and changes that we've been looking at that are specifically going to have impact in the coming years. And, and the first is kind of an expansion of sensing abilities. So we have seen over the past few years and continue to see this kind of vast sensor network being deployed in many different realms and at, many, at, at a huge scale. So everything from you know, kind of social listening and, and web-based sensors to sense kind of what's happening on the network to uh, environmental sensing. There's some incredible work being done by a bunch of different organizations there uh, to data flowing out of the industrial internet and the internet of things to kind of what we've been calling listening machines. So we see more and more systems that are doing kind of continuous recording of video and audio uh, from lots of different objects, including the phones in most of your pockets and your Xboxes and um, children's toys and security cameras and what, whatnot. Um, and so and, and that ability to deploy sensors has also become sort of commodified to the point where it's now plausible for news organizations to be deploying sensing as well, which is something that's, that's fairly new. And so that all speaks to sort of an in increase in scale in terms of journal data journalism, in terms of our ability to have these um, vast like corpora of different spaces that we can listen to and interpret and analyze and apply kind of journalistic techniques to tell stories about. Um, but we also simultaneously are seeing a shift in how that data gets published and 
retrieved and analyzed and understood. And so typically we've kind of seen data published as like these fairly static retrospective collections of information. There's boundaries around them. There's something you can like hand to somebody on a thumb drive or access in some way and then do uh, investigative work on and then report on or present as an interactive piece. Um, and more and more we're seeing a shift to data being published and consumed as streams of messages, like real-time streams of information. Often uh, real-time streams of information at a scale where you can't necessarily even store them for a very long period of time without huge cost involved. And that kind of dramatically changes the way that we, the tools that we use and the kind of techniques that we apply to understand that data and to analyze it and to tell stories about it. So, you know, it shifts from we've looked at this information and something went wrong sometime in the past in the system over here to something's going wrong right now. And that seems like a, a very different thing in that there are different tools that are required to uh, kind of do sense making on data that's in that kind of form. Um, and then finally, I think that we're seeing a lot of interesting things happening in thinking about sense making in the realm of machine learning, especially when we look at things like deep learning and neural networks that are new techniques that are being able to be applied to, to try to make sense of, of streams of information that are very difficult to kind of interpret and probe otherwise, especially when we're thinking about these listening machines, like these streams of video and audio. So all of a sudden, you're hooking up a camera to a neural network, and holy shit, you have a camera that's taking sentences. Like, what do you do with that? And I think that there's, I'm not, I, I'm not sure that we know what kinds of things that's going to enable, but I think there are a lot of interesting possibilities there. I think there are a lot of new challenges in terms of kind of um, authority and accountability and authorship, and I think that there's also um, a, you know, a need for new tools and lots of new questions involved. Just one question, I think this is fascinating. Um, uh, can you give an example of this streaming, um, you know, instantly changing data, mm -hmm. and, and then how you're able to access it either for the public or for your reporters to make it really dynamic? Sure. Um, I mean, I can give a couple of examples. And one is, I, I, think, I think the leading edge of this has been actually in the realm of kind of web analytics, um, where you know, the, the older technique is sort of, we're going to store all this kind of audience behavior information uh, in a database somewhere. And then at some point, we're going to do some analysis on it. We're going to come to a set of conclusions. And that's going to inform how we design our site or how we uh, position our stories going forward, but more and more, and um, you know, we've been working on a lot of tools and kind of visualization for this in the lab. Um, we've been looking at you know these real-time streams of audience behavior, which allows for you know the, the retrospective view allows for this kind of aggregate sense of like this is the time of day that people most frequently come to us on their mobile devices, or these are our most popular sections on Mondays. Um, those kind of top line um, pieces of information. But when you're looking at real-time audience behavior, it's much more like, I see this happening right now. This is kind of the gestalt of like, our community at the moment. How do I respond to that if I want to, like, uh, if I want to shift what's happening? It's this much more conversational approach to uh, <laughs> interacting with our readers and to adapting the way that we publish or the way that we present things um, in response to that. Um, in terms of things that might be possible going forward, I, I mentioned environmental data briefly, but so if we look at things like satellite imagery of the Earth, that's something that um, has typically had a lot of latency. It's like kind of a fairly static set that you can look back on, but we're seeing lots of organizations, um, most notably Planet Labs, is deploying um, satellites that are, they're intending to take a new um, s satellite image of the entire Earth every day. So that's kind of this, um, this temporal fidelity, this temporal resolution that we haven't seen before. And I think that there's this sort of, there's this point when you get to um, near real time with that, that it kind of shifts from like a particle system to a wave system and that like dynamically changes what we can do with that information. So you're, you're able to capture change. Mm -hmm. um, and so instead of saying, this is the way things are, mm -hmm. This is how things are different from yesterday, which exactly. is um, very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. Highly. 
Um, I, let me say a couple things about you sure. first. <laughs> first of all, this is a physicist. Um, um, at, so ignore what I was saying about particles and waves. I like it. At, at the outset, and and you know, I mean, I started in journalism before half of you were born, and the, and the idea of having a physicist in the newsroom, I mean, would have been <laughs> wonderful, but nobody would have thought of it. And and now it's a it's a skill set which is enormously prized. And what um, highly is the chief data scientist of Mashable, and um, he does stuff like statistical learning, predictive anal analytics, and um, there's a proprietary tool called Velocity that does things that I can't barely <laughs> imagine. And um, I also uh, went on Mashable a um, uh, uh, couple, couple of days ago, and I always thought of you guys as sort of tech um, uh, reporting, but of course you've gone much broader, and I was fascinated to see that you had both the top 100 iPhone apps of all time and the world's 100 most beautiful women um, on, the same, <laughs> on, the, on the same day. So you're in the middle of it. Tell us what you're up to and how you see the next five years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it, it may be worth answering the question, why would you want a physicist at a, <laughs> at a, at a media organization? And, you know, I, I came to Mashable uh, with the intention of trying to understand how, how content diffuses on, online. I mean, the, there has been an extraordinary shift in the distribution of content, um, definitely for, for uh, legacy print organizations, but also for relatively new organizations that distribute their content exclusively online. And we really want to understand what, what the process is by which uh, post-publication after a journalist has, uh, has uh, set down uh, their, their piece and, and, and published it, what happens afterwards. And so we actually, we, we, uh, we internally built uh, a, a tool that not only um, curates content, but actually predicts how much engagement it's going to, going to get. And this is not just our own content, but actually content across the... Uh, Across the uh, the web, uh, this we find that this really uh, limits the amount of labor uh, involved in in uh, the work that journalists do in order to source uh, source their stories. Uh, my understanding is that prior to uh, prior to Velocity, it would be literally hours of work just to figure out not do the research for the actual piece that, that, uh, that, that journalists would, uh, would write, but actually figure out what was worth writing about. Because, again, you have to, to, to curate beyond the, the, uh, beyond the din. Um, so that ends up being a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the work that uh, I and my team, uh, my, my team pursue. We also spend a lot of time trying to understand uh, not only uh, the diffusion of content across the web, but also um, for our own our own content, what is the what are the, the various profiles of our our, our audience members? Um, you know, I, I'm I'm really struck and, and kind of humbled to be in, in an audience of uh, what I assume are mostly uh, journalists um, listening to uh, the the previous discussion and looking at uh, uh, the. Uh, the, the unique work on, on police killings. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm particularly struck by how similar the, 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 uh, the, the, the mindset is to generate something as layered and as complicated as that um, to the, the kind of work that one has to do as a data scientist in order to tell a complete quantitative story. Um, my sense is that you know, continuing in the, 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 this, this kind of revolution that, uh, that, that you alluded to before, uh, the democratization of uh, an understanding of statistics, but also tools that make uh, uh, visualizing and analyzing reams of data uh, possible, such that uh, my hope is that in, 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 in the near term future, projects like that will, will, will thrive not only in prestige institutions, but actually like, there, will be, there will be a tendency to actually find open open fora in which large data projects will, will, will be pursued to address large social questions. Uh, that's, that's, that's 
a trend I, 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 I hope for. Thank you, Haile. Our, our last panelist is um, Emily Bell, who's someone I revere as a true, uh, as a true pioneer. Um, you started creating this humongous monster of, of a, um, a digital news organization at The Guardian. Um, and then, not being satisfied with that, you came to the, the US and went to Columbia, where you're, I think, at the pivot point. I mean, there are others, some of them in this room, but you're at, at the pivot point of what we're talking about today, including, if I, if I have this right, you're, you've got the Columbia Journalism School combining with not one, but two engineering schools, Columbia's own engineering school and Stanford's haughty um, Silicon Valley um, and rich. Uh, uh, <laughs> engineering school. They're very nice. Um, <laughs> and, and getting more of what we all agree we need more of, which is people that have the shared DNA of, of coding and thinking about journalism. So how is it going? And where do you see things going? Um, thanks, Paul. I sometimes wish my children could hear people say things like that about me because they wouldn't recognize that picture of me at all. Um, actually, what I did at The Guardian and what I'm now doing at Columbia is, is taking credit for other people's work, which I'm very happy to do. Um, but at, at The Guardian, it really came from um, a set of technologists who I think were probably among the most advanced in the world in thinking about form and format. Uh, people like uh, Stephen Dunn, who was our chief technology strategist, uh, Matt McAllister, who kind of thought about open platform, etc., um, who were way ahead, really, of anybody in the newsroom um, in thinking about how the data layer of the internet was going to change journalism. And sort of, uh, you know, the leadership of Alan Rusbridger, who was really engaged in this stuff, allowed us to do things that just other newsrooms weren't really allowed to do, like spend lots of money on hand building our own system in Java, which was not necessarily the right thing to do, but, but actually <laughs> it was at the time, um, it, it really enabled us to get to a place where now there's a kind of a, a, a short heritage and um, really inspired Bless teams you. like uh, Lee's team here um, are actually doing what, you know, those capabilities sh should allow news organisations to do, right, which is to take um, social, which sits really close to data. Uh, and data and build sort of stories out of it. So I'm, ta so I'm happy to take the credit for all their work. Um, then at Columbia, I, you know, I'm at a midpoint between now and 2020. I've been there five years. And when I got there, um, I did that thing where I looked around and I thought, OK, so, so the thing about Columbia is it didn't teach. Uh, it had some, some interact, uh, interactive news graphic teaching, but it didn't have a single what I call data course um, in the school. Uh, so I, I wrote a paper saying, we may think of ourselves, but no offence to anybody else, here is the best journalism school in the world, because everybody thinks of themselves as the best journalism school in the world. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, and we might continue to be a really great school for writers, but unless we really put data at the heart of what we do, um, we're not going to be the best journalism school in the world for very long, uh, or even be able to think about ourselves. So then we hired Susan McGregor, who's at the back there, um, uh, who was our first hire at the Town Centre, whose background was at the Wall Street Journal interactive team, but also ha has a, as a computer science major. Then um, two years ago, uh, we, three, sorry, three years ago, Mark Hansen joined uh, as director of the Brown Institute. And Mark is unusual in that, you know, you're, you're a physicist. Mark is a world-renowned statistician who works with data and visualization. And Mark walks around the school going, I'm not a journalist. And yet at the <laughs> same time, um, you know, his extreme humility in being not a journalist sort of doesn't really mask the fact that he's actually a genius when it comes to sort of not just working with but talking about data and, and helping it to inform students. And so in the past five years, we've gone from teaching nobody to introducing a dual track with our engineering school. Mm -hmm. And when, when I'm done here, Susan and I are rushing back to uh, look at the projects of six students this year, six or seven students, who are, who are graduating as their master's project. And one of them is doing analysis on a broad corpus of uh, visual and video data that he's collecting around the candidates for the election entirely through um, you know, computational techniques. Uh, one is thinking about building her own kind of autonomous uh, tagging system by looking at kind of taxonomies and using 
you know, uh, NLP and speech, etc. You know, and we and well, when I started, it didn't feel like we were ever going to get anybody to take this course. And we now have 12, 13 students in the school. Uh, we have a higher kind of you know interest and application rate than we've ever had for that. And that's a two-year dual masters with our com computer science school and with journalism school. And that's kind of like our unicorn farm. But then out of that came, <laughs> that, and then, uh, but then out of that came this this vast kind of like interest in what we were doing. We have somebody like Mark who can teach data like nobody else, um, and Susan who has the experience and the background that very few people still in newsrooms have. Uh, so we, we we created a data concentration, and we thought this last year was our first year of admission, and we thought we'd get a class of like 15 or 16, and we got a class of 30. And it's one of the most oversubscribed um, in terms of application rates, the, the, the courses that we do. Uh, so now we have, I don't know, Susan, do we have like, we have like nearly 20, I think we counted up the individual modules and courses that we now teach at all levels in data, and there are way over 20 courses available from people who would be, you know, master's level at computer science, um, right down to people who've never really opened a spreadsheet but will leave with stati sound statistical understanding. And I think so we're all about literacy. And Mark Hansen, who should really be here talking about this, um, he, you know, he, he says this is not going to be embodied by sort of two sets of people or a team. This should be embodied by everybody. You know, this, this, is, this is what we're aiming for, a sort of fundamental realignment of journalism and narrative. Narrative is really, really important, the kind of emotional engagement with stories. Um, but it's a fundamental realignment of journalism around sort of the principles of data science. Um, and, you know, actually, he sent me a paragraph because he's a bit of a control freak. Because I said, what would you say about this? And I want to read this because I think this is really important. Um, and I would also say plus one to everything that all of these guys have said, particularly sort of, I mean, we, we talk a lot to Alexis and Matt and people at the R&D lab, but that world of sensing and gathering data is absolutely where we're going. Predictive patterns for reporting, um, I think, as well as kind of, you know, dissemination is where we're going with all of this. But I said to Mark, what would you say about this? And he said, um, the mingling of narrative of data, of storing artifacts of computing and data science, uh, something genuinely new will emerge. Not a monotonous expanse of, I'm going to take out the name of the media thing here because I don't want him exposed to um, hate <laughs> mail. Uh, not the monotonous expanse of X graphics, but stories uh, that <laughs> we find compelling because of the ingenious way something was measured or a predictive scheme was derived. Story expands, reading expands, our understanding of the world around us expands, which given that he's not a words person is quite a nice way yes. of putting it. And I think the one, I mean, the one thing I would add to that that we're doing, we've got papers on, Meredith is doing a paper for us at the moment on um, AI and journalism, so we're looking at a lot of automation, a lot of AI, a lot of um, NLP and machine learning. Um, but I also think that kind of, you know, the, the, the one thing that you know, if I was sort of going to predict where all of this is going, I think we see this as being, you know, kind of a, a sort of a challenge for the field, but it's, it's an opportunity for us to genuinely remake something, um, to actually kind of like embed new skills. And it's entirely possible to do. The one last thing that we've introduced, which has proved to be enormously successful, is a conversion course, which isn't even a degree. It's like a certificate course. Um, and you can take it over the eight weeks or 16 weeks, and it is designed to take people with humanities backgrounds and give them a really thorough understanding of computation, data, visualization, um, algorithms. So, you know, we think investigating algorithms and being able to describe what they do and understand what they do is actually a fundamental part of nearly every reporter's job. And unless you have an understanding of that, you're not really going to be able to report the world. So we have this thing called the LEAD program, which takes humanities people and turns them into kind of data literate, technology literate uh, journalists, hopefully. But also, these people are going into every field. They're going into history departments. They're going into English departments. They're going into you know, poetry and philosophy departments. Because every field needs this to understand how culture is going to work in the future. So I kind of think, you know, we think about it as journalism, but really it's everything. And, it, and you know, the one, the one thing we could, should hope for is that K through 12 starts to fix some of the problems we're having to yeah. retrogressively sort of fix um, when we get into newsrooms or journalism school. From your lips to God's ears. Um, so I, I'd like to open it up um, to the audience. I just want to say to hiring managers out there, help <laughs> us on the way. Um, so who has the first 
question. Could I ask Emily just a quick, quick uh, okay. follow-up question? Uh, so, uh, you, I mean, you, you have what sounds like an extraordinary educational environment. I'm wondering how heavy a lift it is to extend this, uh, this sort of commingling of, uh, of humanities, uh, 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 humanities uh, focus to, to commingle with uh, the, the kind of skills of data science to extend that more broadly beyond uh, the very special environment that you've built. So, so, so two things, one of which is this is not sort of Columbia boasting and showing up. I mean, one thing I, I would say is that we've been, lots of people have been in, a, inadequate in this area for a long time, probably Columbia included, and that we do have resources and we have endowment and funding, so we should be doing, mm -hmm. you know, the heavy lifting and helping others follow. I mean, what working with people like Susan and Mark have taught me is that actually anyone can do this. You know, there will be people for whom it is, uh, you know, a natural progression. Um, so, for instance, somebody who came out of our LEAD program last year was an English major, um, and uh, he didn't, unfortunately, end up on the, on the dual degree, even though he wanted to take it, because he was snapped up by a newsroom. And he was like, you know, I'm suddenly finding that I'm doing advanced math and really enjoying it. Now, not every, that's not going to be true of everybody. No, that really isn't sure. true of everybody. But I, I think that sort of the, 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 it, it's possible to extend it way more widely than it is. But not just possible, but it, it, it kind of has to happen. Otherwise, we can't participate in democracy. You know, we really can't participate in democracy because we can't interrogate these systems of power, which are essentially built in a completely different way now to documents and, you know, humanity. Well, and I would say, like, just to add on to that, that I think that we're hopefully going to see start seeing a lot of interesting approaches and techniques for um, for making those systems and those processes legible to readers as yeah. well because I think as more of this uh, as more data analysis becomes the core of a lot of the journalism we're doing that like I mean I don't I don't hold any illusion that there's any kind of perfect transparency here but I think that mm. like making making that process of analysis um, legible and interrogatable, if that's the word. And I think that's such a key task. And lots of newsrooms think, oh, well, there's the data. Like, we had an investigative journalist come in and sort of say, oh, get somebody else to do the data. And it's like, no. Mm -hmm. don't, don't, like, you know, kind of understanding and explaining, making it legible for the rest of the world. We talk about how we apply it to our own work, but actually we have to start applying. And that's not graphs and charts. That's kind of tech stories. It's videos. It's GIFs. It's whatever, however you want to explain it. But I think that's absolutely on point. Hi, um, this question is for Haile uh, Owusu, if I'm saying it correctly. You are indeed. So the age-old question in, in newsrooms has been who gets coverage, majorities, minorities, who, and in a, in a time when newsrooms are exceedingly less diverse racially in terms of class. Um, would you sort of peel back how that physicist amazing thing that you're doing that I'm trying to wrap my head around <laughs> guards against? somebody uh, down a dirt road in Catskills, in the Catskills who needs running water, getting coverage or not getting coverage if, I mean like, d does, do hits and what's trending dictate these days and how do you guard against that? It's a really, really tough question. I think it's, it's um, a, I, I will not be able to give you a definitive answer because I think um, it can't just be the, the, the business that I'm fortunate enough to belong to, but I suspect that every, uh, media organization out there is struggling to understand how in a, a period of sharp decline in ad revenue, which typically props up um, much of the, uh, the revenue base for most uh, media organizations, how you tell important stories and keep the lights on simultaneously. And oftentimes uh, that negotiation does mean that uh, there is a lot of uh, non-coverage of, impo of, of important stories. Um, all I can say is that uh, the work that I do attempts, minimally attempts to try to understand those dynamics and really put them in sharp relief so that, uh, that, uh, that journalists writing stories can actually have a sense of the landscape and compensate for uh, the, the, the kind of unequal distribution that tends to happen in, in a, in a in a market dominated by uh, eyeballs and clicks and so on. Does that affect how you um, think about how you measure impact or engagement? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, uh, velocity is a tool uh, which I spend a lot of time on 
we have to come up with metrics that uh, uh, not only uh, forecast uh, future trends, but also gauge uh, the importance of those trends for, for the, uh, the end user. And the way that we use it internally is not just uh, for uh, you know, this kind of curation task for, 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 for journalists, but we also use it to calibrate our business. And we, we have to, again, do this negotiation between uh, important stories and uh, you know the 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 crude base of our, our business, which is to, to so yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I I I when I actually construct the metrics for the, for the uh, for for this tool, I absolutely have to think about that that balance. Somebody on this side. Hi, I was wondering about the how prevalent the use of software to generate automatically generate stories from data sets. Um, how prevalent it is across newsrooms. I understand that AP announced the other day that they are implementing um, a certain software to generate stories. Do you, sorry, do you mean actually write them and construct them, or like yeah. narrative? Yeah. Yes, it's pretty. I mean, it's pretty prevalent, and it's getting more more so. So um, uh, narrative science is, is one of the sort of largest, um, best known companies in this area, which came out of a, a project at Northwestern University, and it's led by a, a computer scientist called Chris Hammond. Um, and he has a theory which says, in the future, 90% of all stories will be automatically generated, uh, which sounds shocking. Um, but then he says, but then he says, the, the, uni the universe of stories that can be told is going to exponentially expand um, just because everything is going to throw off a data trail which can actually be turned into kind of like a narrative sentence. So, you know, you do see great things like QuakeBot, which was built, you know, from the LA Times data desk to take UGS, um, uh, UGSC da data and turn it into instant reports faster than we could report an earthquake. Um, sports results, uh, financial reports, if you're going to look at kind of um, I think Forbes or Fortune or maybe both of them, you know, just kind of earnings reports are already written. They pass, you know, those pass the Turing test. You wouldn't read them and think, it's funny, a machine wrote this. Um, it's one of the things that we, we think is going to be sort of transformative in the next two or three years. But they're also kind of, doesn't it doesn't tell the whole story to say it's going to be, you know. Yeah, I, I would think, I would say that that narrative has been sort of presented as this black and white thing in a way that it's, sure. that it's not, that you have either things are, are automated or yeah. they're done by humans and there's this kind of qualitative value ascribed to whether it's done by a machine or a human. And I think there's actually this whole spectrum in between of semi-automated kind of collaborative yeah. tools where you yeah. have um, automated processes that can sort of give journalists superpowers mm -hmm. that you can augment people's yeah. abilities to report um, in ways that, that we haven't been able to do before. And I think that yeah. that's really powerful. And I think that there's a whole realm of kind of semi-automation and reporting that it, that we're going to see that is not about like replacing people's jobs and like all the fear that comes along with that kind of narrative, but with actually like creating really amazing tools for journalists to do their jobs better. Yeah. We so, have time. So you, you're bullish on the the, the prospect that uh, even semi-automation will move beyond the sort of uh, financial reports and so on to more. Yeah. Um, definitely. Really. Definitely. Yeah. Hmm. And I would say the other thing is what you do see is really popular right now is also automatic uh, distribution. So once it's written, yeah. algorithms that come yeah. in and decide where it goes out, at what time, sure. or what platform. In fact, we could have a whole news ecosystem which is entirely composed of bots um, that both read and distribute and write. <laughs> Maybe. That's a... We have time for one more. Thanks. So one of the things that's wonderful about the internet is that unlike the old print world, where uh, the gating factor was how many pages you had the ability to fill every week, now there's infinite space. A couple of years ago, um, Google changed their algorithm so that when I search for something and you search for something, we actually see different results. So one of the questions I have for people in the news world is, um, are you looking at having basically a paper, a, a, my version of the New York Times being different than my wife's version of the New York Times? And the frightening thing about that is right now I feel like people that, um, feel strongly about a topic are only seeing media that reflects their preconceived view of the world. They're surrounding themselves with that media that, tell, that sort of tells them back what they think already instead of being exposed to other points of view. So 
it's exciting on the one hand to think that I get a paper that's personalized for my own uh, curiosity based on my previous searches. It's also scary that I'm only being shown things that I've already expressed interest in. How do you address that in, in this new news world that we live in? I mean, so two things. The, the even scarier, if you want to characterize it as scary rather than exciting, is that those decisions are often going to be now going to be made by aggregational platforms, particularly, specifically Facebook. Uh, you know, Twitter is now going to, and we don't really know how any of that works. Those are sort of black boxed um, algorithms, uh, which is, and as you say, you know, if you want to see a group of students look surprised, get them to open their laptops and tell them just to Google a term, and then ask them to read the top results because it hasn't really occurred to them often that these things are always going to be personalized whether you've asked there is no such thing as just google you know it is like that everybody gets different results and that's a huge change for media we've always grown up with like broadcast the idea of broadcast and that's kind of just degrading right now so it's not even that the new york times is deciding what you see it's facebook decides which bits of the new york times you see and which bits you don't uh, and that i think is is on a philosophical and actual kind of you know governance plane, the single biggest sort of challenge and issue for the for the the press, whatever that may be, journalists in the next few years. Maybe. Uh, uh, sorry, I'll just add that personalization doesn't have to imply pandering, right? I mean, a, a good approach to personalization would try very much to avoid you being habituated and essentially bored with the content that you uh, that you're presented. So. Uh, to my mind, a smart personalization would actually pepper in, uh, pepper into uh, your sort of solidified worldview things that are challenging to it. And that's a hard problem, of course, but that's I think the correct approach to it. Okay, really quick. Yeah. Uh, I, well, I think one thing underlying all this hasn't come up yet, which I was in the interest of like Jeff Jarvis, like putting an action item out to everybody in this room, which I think he's great at doing. It doesn't happen enough. Is um, everything we're talking about is prefaced on data that most of us don't own. Yeah. Um, and we have yeah. to be, as a group, really active and forceful in trying to make sure that data is available, whether it's the Guardian forcing the government to make it available, whether it's somebody like me making sure these social networks have APIs, or whether it's the other things. Like, all of this is based on data we don't own, and we have to be the ones out there making sure that there are either APIs available or these other things. Uh, and a large part of where that goes is going to determine what this stuff looks like in five years. So. Amen, and thank you all. I wish we had another hour. Thank you.